Welcome back to the Nerobin channel. This is going to be my review of the AM5. I haven't really spent a huge amount of time with the scope, but I think I've collected enough data to have a good opinion about it. And yes, I've watched the other reviews out there, so I'm going to try and cover the stuff that I haven't seen anybody else cover. Because I like to talk about things that other channels don't cover, let's talk about the locking mechanism that is in these scopes. You've probably all noticed they don't necessarily always need counterweights. This is a pretty big scope, but yeah, it doesn't need a counterweight. And if you, you know, take the power out of this thing, it won't flop over and hit itself, okay? Even though there's no locks on here. The locks are built into the gearing mechanism, at least on the RA axis. On the deck axis, there actually isn't a lock. Instead, it's basically just like that. See, uh, it's not powered and I can turn it still but it's, it's basically against the, the leverage of the gears. These gears are 300 to one ratio, which is pretty high. And so, yes, the deck axis doesn't actually lock, but we typically balance the deck axis. You know, we, I've got another video about where I show you how to kind of like balance your scope before you sit it, figure out where you're gonna sit it on the Wasmundi or Vixen plate. The RA axis has a lock that is negatively activated, so to speak. In other words, when there's power going through it, it unlocks itself. And when power is cut off from it, well, it self-locks via spring action. So there's no way ever this thing's gonna flip around and damage your equipment. Now, another thing, and this is the counterweight shaft. This scope doesn't, it's not heavy enough to really need a counterweight. However, there is a limit to the weight that you can put on this shaft. And I wanna tell you why there's a limit. It actually doesn't have anything to do with the mechanisms, the gears, or the bearings that are in the head of the mount. It's actually <laughs> the way the shaft screws into this thing that is why there is a 5k limit on the counterweights that you can put on this thing. Because I've seen some guys put way more weight on this thing than it's rated for. And, and you guys have actually even commented a couple of times. I had one guy, he thought I had 20 kilograms on this thing and I didn't. Okay, it's, it's, it's really about seven kilograms is what I had on here. But anyways, the limit here, this threaded in part. Now, if you look at the ioptron behind me, it's a big shaft with a big threaded end. And yeah, it's about one and a half inch thread. And it goes into a steel threaded shaft. This guy though, actually threads into an aluminum body. So uh, the threads being shallow and small, there isn't a lot there. There's not a lot of meat there. So if you hung a lot of weight off this thing, you risk actually shearing this thing off of the body of the scope. That's why there's a five kilogram limit. Now, if you are one of those people like me who has an odd size weight, this one right here is a 2.7 kilogram weight. Well, if you're in that kind of situation, then what I would recommend that you do is if you put two of those on there, so for me, it's like 5.6 kilograms. It's a little bit over the weight, but you put it far enough up the shaft here, it's kind of like not putting as much strain on those threads. You won't ever have to worry about damaging it. For a long time, I have been a huge fan of ioptron mounts. And this is my first non-ioptron mount that I've liked. <laughs> so yeah, a little bit of preview of my conclusion on this mount. One of the coolest things about this thing is the way it guides and behaves in the wind. Now, if you're in a windy kind of environment, or maybe you just live in a climate where there all is, is perpetual wind, these harmonic mounts are definitely for you, all right? And I'll tell you why. It's because there's absolutely no backlash in them. Because of the way this mechanism works, okay, the gear, the teeth of the gears, are always engaged fully on each side. Now, with the ioptron that's behind me, it basically has a big lead screw on it, and the teeth engage on one side of that lead screw as it pushes the gear, or pulls it, I should say, you know. And because of that, there is always, always inevitably backlash in a mount like that. That backlash means that when that thing blows in the wind, it's gonna move back and forth, back and forth. And you will invariably get subs that will be destroyed by gusts of wind. Whereas these harmonic mounts are absolutely solid. As long as your system is stiff, 
as long as the wind can't actually bend anything, your guiding's going to be rock solid and good, even in a nice breeze, which is kind of a cool thing. And it's actually, based on the testing that I've done so far, it has resulted in me losing fewer subs and getting more good exposure time in. Now, I have spent a lot of time with my iOptron mount, and I've captured a lot of data with this guy. I really like him, but I always, inevitably, always, I always lose some subs. I don't know why. And sometimes it's like the thing, I don't know, it dithers in the middle of an exposure, or maybe it makes some correction or something or another, and, you know, it just doesn't collaborate very well with my ASI Air. So far, my experience with the AM5 mount is that ZWO hardware, talking to ZWO hardware, is absolutely flawless. I took 120 subs one night with this thing. It did not miss a single one. With this guy, I, it seems like I always throw out about 10%, and some nights are better than others. Yeah, I think it actually depends on maybe where the gear is on this thing clockwise and so forth. I know I can actually like release the locks on it and retime it, bring it around, re-zero it, and find a sweet spot in the gear, which probably means that this thing needs to be tuned up. All right, so this wouldn't be a video by me if I didn't rant about at least one thing. This port right here, it's the auto guide port. First off, you should never use this port. If you are, please smack yourself and come to your senses and stop using it, <laughs> okay? Secondly, I'm kind of disappointed to see a modern mount like this even includes one of these. I mean, really, this is like putting an exhaust system on a Tesla. Why? It's outdated. Don't do it, okay? You know, so do not use the auto guide port. Use the USB system, either use Oscom drivers or Alpaca or whatever it is they're coming out with now, or your ASI Air will, of course, lock into this thing automatically. You don't have to worry about anything. But yeah, the auto guide port. I don't understand why they still put these on mounts. Really. It's, yeah, it's almost insulting. Now, one other little thing here. The hand controller, and I really do like the hand controller. It's simple, it's easy to use, it's very intuitive, but with this mount, and I know that this is actually something that they're fixing with the next mount, the AM3. In order to run the Wi-Fi in this thing, you have to plug in this hand controller, which seems a little odd to me. I, I don't know why this isn't something that can be like overridden by hardware, unless there actually is some hardware inside of this. I don't know, maybe the, maybe the antenna is actually in the handle because the handle is plastic and this guy is entirely aluminum. We all know what kind of happened with the aluminum Airs that they first came out with, the Air Pro, that, uh, that had a lot of Wi-Fi range issues because aluminum kind of captures those kinds of signals. So I think in a future version of the AM5, we will probably see the removal of the necessity to hook this up because it is one more thing to get tangled. Which kind of brings me into my next topic. Cable management with this guy. <sighs> okay, it's not bad, okay? The, the ports are in an okay spot. At first I thought to myself, wouldn't it be better to put them in the bottom? But then as you can see by how high I've got this counterweight mounted, it might interfere with things there. So really, the front here is kind of the best spot for it. That being said though, I, I really wish that the, at least USB and the power DC here were routed through the head rather than me having to attach it separately. Because it's just kind of one of those things that I've seen coming out in a lot of other high-end mounts. And it's just, you know, something I'd like to see in maybe a new version of this is that the porting and everything maybe is back here in the back where it's kind of out of the way. Now, let's move into the back. This is something that I really like about this mount. Polar alignment with this mount is a real joy. It's, it's, it's really an outright pleasure. I gotta say, I probably spend half as much time polar aligning with this mount as I do either of my iOptrons for one single reason, stiction, okay? With the stiction, 
that is in the base of my option mount. It's ridiculous. I have to go like almost a full turn on one of these knobs with my iOptron in order to get the thing to actually start moving in the opposite direction if I go too far. This guy, a much smoother experience polar aligning. Now, I do hate these things, but yeah, it kind of works for this situation. And, and by the way, the two bubble levels that are up here, some people kind of freak out if one of them doesn't match the others. Just ignore it. Think about it this way. If you accidentally damage one of them, well, you've got a backup. And as far as the bubble level goes, I mean, really, it's just to kind of approximately get your telescope level so that it doesn't fall over because maybe it's leaning like the Tower of Pisa. That's really all those bubble levels are there for. Harmonic mounts like high speed guiding, so to speak. In other words, typically you're doing exposures of one second to two seconds at the absolute most. And most of the time, you know, your, your target should be half a second or one second. That's how these things like to guide. My iOptron back there, I could do three and sometimes four second exposures. And it actually liked those kinds of exposures. And that's because it has low periodic error. Well, actually, relatively low. This guy's actually a little better than that. But that one probably needs a tune-up. Now, about the periodic error. Don't worry about it. Basically, periodic error, I mean, I really, I tell people, you know, throw out your periodic error chart. It means nothing with these mounts. Really, it does. Because you have absolutely no backlash and absolutely no stiction with these things, Essentially, your guiding will correct any errors that are in the gears of these things. And so the fact that there is periodic error in these is really nothing to worry about. You just need to have good guiding, which and you, you should be guiding. I mean, really, are you doing astrophotography without guiding? You know, please have your head examined if you are not trying to guide. So, yeah, guiding basically makes the whole periodic thing really null and void. And the fact that these things respond so fast to pulses, that's what these guys are like using. They really do create nice long exposures. And I, I do intend to use this guy to do some 600 second exposures, which on the iOptron behind me was a challenge. Okay, this guy, it's, it's very easy to do them. And that's just because the guiding fixes the periodic error. It's, it's not even something to think about. Now, we all know that the carbon fiber tripod that you can order with this thing is pretty light. And I see a lot of guys worry about these things tipping over in the wind because, you know, by the way, these things are great in the wind. I said that earlier in the video. The nice thing about the bag is that I just throw an extra counterweight in the bottom of the bag on top of my power supply here, and it's just fine. I haven't had to really worry about it. The tripod is very nice and sturdy. There's only one complaint that I really have about the tripod, and that is the locking collars. In the cold, it's a little bit hard to lock them really good, and that's because the knurling in them has been uh, knurled. It's been knurled first when it was machined, and then they tumble it. I kind of wish they would machine the whole thing, and then tumble it, and then afterwards come back and knurl it again so that knurling still has its nice grittiness. The stainless steel right here, on this guy is nice and grippy, and I wish that the knurling on the tripod legs kind of had that same effect. But the nice thing about these things is that they're very big, so even if you're using gloves, it, they seem to work out pretty good. How should you kind of configure something like this? Do I think the pier extension is necessary? It's not very expensive relative to the rest of the scope. I would say by all means, get the pier extension especially if you're going to have a big scope on here like this. And, and also, if you're buying the AM5, okay, it's got a 45 pound capacity limit on it. Well, 44 pounds. Someday you're probably gonna want a big scope on this thing. So you might as well get this guy now. And, and really all of my scopes, except for my smallest iOptron 25 mount, the ZEQ25, have a peer extension on them. And I love them because it just, it means I don't have to worry about things crashing into each other. Because I am losing daylight here really fast, it's getting dark. There's some things that I want to I want to open these questions up to you, and I would love to read your comments below. There are these threaded holes on the tops and the ends of these plates. 
I'm curious, what are they for, okay? Is this a, another accessory that maybe ZWO is gonna come out with? And, and also, by the way, for those of you who want to park these things with the tube, the tube going this direction instead of this direction, it's very simple. There's a couple of bolts that hold this plate on. And you just take them out, turn the thing 40, 90 degrees, and then bolt them back in again. So that's how you take care of that. I really like this thing. I, I'm totally sold on the harmonic mounts from now on. I think the only mounts that I'll be buying from now on will be harmonic mounts. And I hope they make some bigger ones soon because I, I really want to build a rig that's going to be around 100 pounds. And, and this, of course, won't do that. Okay. When I was at Neef, I talked to some of the other big guys out there, the guys who make the really, really big astrophotography mounts. Astrophysics, one of them. And I asked them, are they looking at this kind of drive mechanism and they said absolutely not because of the periodic error my answer to that question is they're nuts <laughs> okay you should not be tracking your targets you need to be guiding because guiding allows you to dither and in astrophotography dither or die that's our mantra if you're not dithering you might as well be dead okay you might as well not take the astro photos yes you've got to be guiding and that opens up the world of dithering to you, which you know, just is a huge improvement in your imaging. If you're not dithering yet, you need to start doing that because it really will revolutionize your astrophotography. Well, let's kind of wrap things up about this guy. This guy here, I am very pleased with. With my Ioptron, the best RMS I could get was 0.7. With this guy, it seems like I'm always getting 0.5 or better sometimes 0.4 and I've even seen it go down to 0.3. That to me is incredible. That means that the resolution that I can capture has really gone up because of this mount. Secondly, okay, because this thing is basically windproof, <laughs> yeah, it means that there are more nights that I can capture images and that of course increases the amount of integration time that I can get. And then Last, but certainly not least of all, this is the biggest thing of all, is the number of subs that I have been able to capture with this guy that were good, okay? That were not the fault of the mount. <sighs> Basically, this guy has got a perfect record so far. Since I've purchased this thing, I have yet to lose a single sub to the mount. Not a single sub have I lost. With my Ioptron, it seems like I always lose 10, Sometimes 20, sometimes 30%, and sometimes there's nights where every single sub is bad. So yeah, yeah, this guy has uh, really improved my astrophotography, and I highly recommend it.